Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's Food Systems in Season. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida Extension in Hernando County. And today we have a whole bunch of people back on here who have given presentations during our spring sessions. Hopefully, either you watch them live or you watch the recordings on YouTube. So today is more for you than it is for us. If you have any questions from any past presentations or sessions, and gosh, we even have more people popping in here to be able to answer your questions, just go ahead and put them in the comments and we'll share your questions. And I'm sure that between all of us, whatever you ask, we could probably answer. And if we can't, we're going to find an answer for you one way or the other. So um, Wendy's on here again with me today. Good morning, Wendy. I think. Good um, morning, everybody. Forgive my camera not being off today, but I am here with you all to answer. We'll go live for some Q&A. Okay. And we have Tara back here. Good morning, Tara. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm doing very well. And we have Prissy back here once again, who has an ever-changing background. <laughs> oh, yes. I like to be always evolving. <laughs> Good morning. It's nice to see everybody again. Prissy Fletcher from St. John's County. And we have Lou Ann Duncan back, who was with us last week doing food preservation and canning, canning demonstration. Good morning, Lou Ann. Good morning. And we have Lori Johnson, who's working on getting the camera going. And, oh my gosh, everybody's just popping in now. Uh, we have Lisa Sanderson, who's back with us, who spoke a few weeks ago about uh, uh, reducing food waste and how you can start vegetables from just little vegetable scraps. Good morning, Lisa. How are you? Good morning. How are you? I think we're all great. Um, if anybody has any questions or comments, please go ahead and share, because this is going to be our last class for the spring season because spring is definitely upon us right now. And I think before you realize it, it's gonna be summer in just a few weeks. So if any of you, any of our regular viewers or participants has any suggestions or ideas about topics you wanna to see in the future, feel free to share them. Like I said, if you have any questions about any of our past classes, go ahead and ask. Or if you have questions about something that maybe we didn't cover, you can ask that also. And I'm yeah. super curious to see if folks have implemented anything that you've um, learned from our classes, whether it's the mindfulness, um, home food preservation, any, uh, like, like Bill mentioned, uh, food waste. And it seems like Lori might be having some technical difficulties getting in, but she's trying. But yeah, so type those in the chat. We'd love to hear Okay, we have one question here from PJ, and she asks, if I make raised bed boxes, can I line the bottom underneath to keep things from getting in from under? So, Prissy, you probably have an answer to this. What kind of different things could get into a raised bed that maybe you don't want in your raised bed? Well, I'm also going to give Tara the opportunity to this is really her area of expertise, but um, there are landscape fabrics that you can use, but also be mindful of what you're planting and the depth that you need for that crop. So if you're planting things like carrots or things like potatoes, just make sure that you're not putting it too shallow. So you're giving it plenty, plenty of uh, room for those roots to grow. But um, again, I'm going to let Tara take this one. Um, so I, I'm not sure if the question is about keeping critters from digging up underneath or if it's more keeping weeds at bay. So it would, you know, depend on, on what you're after. But if you were to, like, if I were to do it, it, I would most likely line it with cardboard or newspaper. So it would eventually decompose and then making that easier to work the soil later if you wanted to. Um, and then, like Prissy was saying, if you plant a root crop, it's not going to impede the roots. So it would depend on how how thick your raised bed was, you know, how many inches. But if I did it, I would do something that was that would decompose and contribute to the soil over time. 
Anyone else? I see that we have Norma on here. I think she's working on getting her camera straightened out. Norma spoke uh, in our first session about spring vegetable gardening. So Norma, can you hear us okay? Is your microphone working? Oh, Norma just disappeared. So I think um, when people build and use a raised bed, one problem that you can have, well, first of all, if you build a raised bed, you don't want to use just regular garden soil in it. You want to get some kind of quality um, sterilized soil to put in your raised bed to grow your vegetables and plants in. But something that can happen over time is if you have a problem in your garden with nematodes, nematodes can over time move through the soil and get into your raised bed. So now you build a raised bed to avoid the nematodes. And if you're not careful, nematodes can get into your raised bed and cause the same problems that you had out in your garden. Um, a lot of people will use something like newspaper or cardboard in the bottom because that does break down. If you use something that doesn't let water move through it, you may end up with a very soggy raised bed because the water can't drain very well. So you can use screen, you can use newspaper, you can use cardboard. I know people use all the above. And Norma, do you have any suggestions? I kind of see you here. There we go. And I actually have a suggestion as well. If you're sure. if you're building your bed out of um, any kind of uh, pressure treated wood or treated wood, you may want to use uh, fabric. Even though I hate using fabric in a garden, it's one of those things that you can also use to line the that fabric. You know, to line those the treated wood. So if for some reason you want it to be longer lasting and you're using a different kind of wood, you can do that to, to kind of uh, line that bed. And then that, you know, it negates the fact that you might use newspaper down there. So you could probably still do the newspaper and just cut the fabric around the outside edge. But a lot of times I recommend using that. Okay. What about using rocks at the bottom? See, I talked to the Joneses. So if you know, if you know Roger and Johanna Jones in our garden, so they do our vegetable garden. I've chatted with them because I wanted to start doing some raised beds. And they say that those nematodes will still come up if all you're using is gravel. And so I don't know, you know, I would like to find out just how, you know, how that really happens. But we'd have a bad nematode in our vegetable garden. So it'd be kind of nice to try and find it another way that it may work that you don't have those things coming up through your, your bed. So Norma may have other suggestions. Can she hear us? Okay, Wendy would like to know, for those people who are watching us and tuning in live, um, what have you guys either learned or implemented after watching any of the um, episodes in our series here? Have you learned or started using anything about food preservation, reducing food waste, practicing mindfulness? So if you have, just go ahead and share that in the comments. And have you learned anything about planting spring vegetable garden, preparing healthy recipes using those spring vegetables? I know that um, uh, we covered um, food preservation and we have one question here about, let me go ahead and get it. And let me ask Luann, when people dry foods to preserve them, how long can you store those dried foods for so that they're still safe? Yeah, um, you know, traditionally they can store them forever um, if they're dried and com completely sealed. One of the things you have to worry about when you dehydrate at home is you're not using quite as many chemicals that they might use um, in commercial products. So especially with the jerky, um, it says you can keep it up to two weeks in the refrigerator. If you're going to keep it at room temperature, probably just a couple days. And then if you want to keep it for longer, it's just best to freeze it. And I'll be honest with you, I had put some in the refrigerator after drying it and kind of forgot about it. And about three weeks later, it was starting to get a little bit mold on it. That can be a sign that it wasn't quite dry enough or that it just um, was still not as many preservatives in it. One of the other things about when you dry the food and try to keep it, the longer you keep it, 
you're going to still get carbohydrates out of that food, but you're not going to get vitamins and minerals. So use everything within a year if it's like fruits and vegetables. Okay, we got a question for Lori here. Um, what's something to reduce food waste when using carrots? Um, I think Wendy asked that one. <laughs> Um, so, uh, when you have any fresh carrots, you may not, you may use your, uh, carrots, but maybe not the carrot tops. Um, so a nice way to decrease your waste, or if maybe your carrot tops are growing much better than your carrots, <laughs> that's happened to me. Um, you can make a carrot top pesto sauce. Um, so making your own homemade pesto sauce is super easy. Um, and that way you're not throwing away those greens and waste them. You can use them by themselves or you can add spinach, um, add some lemon juice and garlic um, and some nuts if you like and just blend it up in your food processor and you can store them in uh, freezer safe containers, um, in small containers and then put them um, defrosted and put it on fish or pasta or use it as a dip. Um, but that way um, it gives a cheaper way of buying uh, store-bought pesto, less uh, ingredients and you're not wasting your that's awesome. Thank you, Lori. And I don't know if you have a link to that PDF that we could put in the, the chat for folks um, to check it out. I wasn't sure if you had that as a live document. Um, I have um, a video, so I will find the video clip real quick and I will put that in the chat. Perfect. Thank you. And I think we have a question for Lisa here from PJ. Will stumps of veggies make or grow full on edible vegetables? Well, from what I understand, they will. So I actually um, had done a demonstration as part of this. And so in that video, I took some of those same vegetables and planted them in our salad bed. So we have a, a salad table out in the garden that we did as, uh, with Luann. We did a salad table workshop and everybody built their own salad table. So I went ahead and built one and put it out in the garden as a demo. So we have regular things growing that we started from seed, but also have some of those um, vegetable that we that we save. So uh, and planted those the green onions. I have the celery, which is out there growing. And so you, you can actually take those and grow them out in the garden. Uh, it's good to I think to root them first. And I realize that when I usually say this for most things, I'm saying that when you're rooting things in water, you're not ending up with root caps and but I don't, I, that doesn't bother me in this situation because it's not a high dollar item. It's a leftover that you're trying to make more from. So yeah, the, and so I've grown, uh, I've got celery, green onions and a couple of the other things that I cut um, out in that garden to see how they're going to do and may talk about those, you know, some other time on video or something. So people can try it. So this reminds me of a project we did a few years ago for kids. We called it garbage gardening. It's, it's really fun to teach kids how to do this. That's a, it's a much fun, funner name for kids, too. So what yeah, that you is a good title for it. Yeah, I like the title. So what kind of garbage did you use? It, it was the veggie scraps. So um, like potatoes, celery, onion, beets. Uh, what else? I'm trying to remember. Ooh, um, I just thought of a good name, Garbage to Goodness. There you go. <laughs> That's a good one. Okay, here I have a link to that carrot top pesto. And I'll go ahead and put that in the comments for everybody. And we had a question a little while ago. And I'll let Tara and Lisa and whoever else wants to kind of talk about this. And it's about using rain barrel water to water your um, garden. And I assume that's an edible garden. And PJ's worried about toxins in the rain or the rain barrel water. So what would you tell people about using rain barrel water to water an edible vegetable garden with? Well, I'll start with that. So, so I, I do a lot of training about uh, edible landscaping. The fact that so many of the, the folks in our county have reclaimed water. And I kind of associate this with that reclaimed water. So if you want to do something that's that you can harvest 
and eat without cooking it, you could use your rain barrel. You can use your reclaimed water. But the problem is, is that uh, you really, if you're, if it's going to be something like lettuce or things that you want to eat fresh, you really need to use more potable uh, water resources like your your garden hose hooked up to a sprinkler, but irrigation, no rain barrels, no. So if you have rain barrel water, that's fantastic. Use it to water those things that are flower containers, you know, that um, that you, you don't have to worry about harvesting and eating, but you can still enjoy. And so that's a nice way to save water when you're watering those extra things or things that you have in your landscape, but just not the edibles. Tara, do you have anything to add? Um, I might just add that a, another reason, not just the rain itself, but what the rain travels over. So when it travels over your roof and down your gutters, um, the contaminants that could be in that or perhaps heavy metals that may be in the roofing materials. So it's just to think about that aspect that's getting onto whatever you're watering. And, and washing it will not be enough to take care of that. When you're when you're harvesting lettuce and things like that, do we have an Edith Pub on rain barrels that we could share? That you do you know of? Uh, I'm not sure if there's an Edith Pub. I, I'm, okay. there, I know there's the so so we did recently write a Florida friendly Edith Pub on re, that talked about reclaimed water. Um, it's actually not published yet now that I'm saying that, but it's in the works. And but there are there are Edis pubs out there on reclaimed water. And I would I would think that the uh, recommendations would be similar with rain barrels. So uh, it, it basically says if you are watering a vegetable that you're going to cook, peel, uh, or otherwise, you know, you know, heat up that it would be okay to water with reclaimed water, but if it's raw, you wouldn't want to. And if it touches the edible part of the fruit that's raw, you wouldn't want to. But if it was just watering the root system, that would be safer. But the, there is a, um, is it FDAX? Um, or it might be DEP, but it basically says if it's, if it's cooked, it's safer, but if it's raw, it's not. I just shared a link to some University of Florida information on rain barrels in general. If anybody's interested in getting a rain barrel or making one. Um, Chrissy, how important is food safety with commercial growers? Because I know that you work more with farmers and commercial people. Oh yeah, that's that's definitely um, a big one, especially with the the fresh commodities like you know lettuce, leafy greens, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, there's uh, numerous certifications um, that our farmers have to go through to make sure that things are being clean in a proper way. They're being stored in a sanitary fashion, um, and you know if you know, some of the more high tech farmers have automated systems for this. Um, then small farms, you know, they're doing it by hand. So a um, lot of effort that goes into making sure that, you know, residues from pesticides aren't lingering or any kind of foliar fertilizer. So um, there's a lot of comfort that can be known. And, you know, farmers have a lot of legal requirements when it comes to anything that's not going to be processed. It's going to be eaten raw, like a, like a blueberry. Um, make sure that what you're eating is safe to consume. So it's, it's a, it's a very thick uh, textbook that the farmers have to keep track of during those inspections. So uh, it, a lot of work goes into it. Yeah, no, it's very important for commercial growers and with homeowners, you might not realize that if you're collecting water that comes off of your roof, your roof isn't very clean. I mean, birds sit up there and dirt gets up there and a lot of different things that you may not want to end up on your vegetables. So you need to be kind of careful about that. And for Luann, uh, Rick learned, has used some of the freezing tips that he learned for fruits and he learned not to can by water bath. So I know that you can can by water bath. You just have to be careful what you're canning by water bath, right? Definitely. It's, it's your low acid vegetables and, um, 
those are the things that you shouldn't use the water bath, but use the water bath for your jams, your jellies and your fruits, tomatoes and pickles. Those things that have added acid to them. Yeah, I used that to make strawberry jam a couple of years ago. And if you wait until the time of year where the price of strawberries and availability are, you know, really good, then that's the time of year to kind of load up on Florida strawberries and make some strawberry jam. Yeah. Luann, let me ask you, are there any recipes for making strawberry jam that don't use quite as much sugar? Well, there are. And um, I think she showed you the different um, pectins that you do with that. Mm -hmm. they, and there, I, <laughs> she said there's, there's recipes and there are, but there are just so few. And I think we showed a copy of the book, So Easy to Preserve. One of the things we really need is more research on that because sugar is the, one of the main parts of the preservation for that jam and jelly. I mean, yeah, it's high acid fruit typically, but it's a lot of sugar that really keeps that safe. And I will tell you, I use pectin with low acid, um, of the less sugar, and um, it was strawberry jam. And it was a small container, but um, I put it out for a class. They sampled it, but within two days, it molded in the refrigerator after the class. So it, I would do it in smaller containers because it might not keep as long. Okay. That's a good point. And I don't know, um, Norma, are you able to join us? I don't know if I'm, I don't know if you can hear us well, but I'm dying yeah, to know about you. your garden. Where is your garden at this point? What does it look like? So I'm actually at my office today. So unfortunately I can't show you anything from my garden. Um, it's coming along well. We're a little later than usual just because we had that cold snap. So we watch the weather a lot. So March, around March 15th is the time to put your garden in where I am in central Florida. But because we had that cold snap that was coming around the 12th or so, we didn't plant. So um, we're a little late right now. But my, I will post some pictures on on Facebook and whatnot. So if you follow my program area on Facebook, you'll be able to see um, the garden as it progresses. That sounds great. I'm gonna see if I can find your link to share. Okay, like I said earlier, for everybody watching, this is all for you. So if you have any questions, just go ahead and put them in the chat and take advantage of having all these experts on screen all at once to be able to answer them. Um, we have one about drying herbs here. And PJ asks, what about drying herbs and what other things can we dry to use later? Things like fruits and what else? So I guess this is for Luann and Lori and Wendy, all the above. If somebody wants to go first, I'll wait. Okay. Go ahead, um, You're the expert. <laughs> well, let me tell you, I used to like to show people how to dry herbs in their microwave just so I could show them how they catch on fire. Um, they they do. They ignite so quickly and it is quick and easy. But, you know, in with air conditioning and indoors, our humidity is pretty reasonable. So one of the things that the USDA book recommends and I like to do is punch a few holes around the sides of a brown bag. And then you put the herbs down in there and tie it and just hang it on a doorknob in your house. And within a day or two, it's dry. And if anything crumbles off, it's in the bag and it's still food safe. You don't have to use a dehydrator or have any special equipment for the herbs. Now, we can't do anything outside here, but um, the fruits, if you have an air fryer, or your convection oven will go down low enough to like 130 or 140. You can still do those things. The thing is, is you can even do it if you have a gas range that the pilot light is on and it's just a little bit warmer. Otherwise, if you don't have special equipment, you have to 
turn the oven on, turn it off, put the stuff in, blow a fan on it, you know, but it can be done. But you can make fruit leathers, dried fruit. Um, dried fruit on a salad is just makes it special, in my opinion. So, yeah, you can dry even the dried vegetables. They're concentrated in flavor. It gives a little bit of texture, a little bit of different flavor to whatever you're using. You can sprinkle it on top. You can powder them and mix them into dishes so that you can sneak it into people if they don't like to eat those things. So I encourage people to still dehydrate. What was the dehydrator? I know you shared with us the dehydrator that you had, Luann. What, I mean, how much do those typically range in cost? I just saw two days ago, I happen, happened to be in Walmart looking at that. And I'm trying to think, I, I don't know what brand they have there, but they usually carry a dehydrator. I'm not sure it's the Nesco, but we really don't promote brands. What you want to have, though, is I bought one real cheap once at um, on sale at Aldi's and it was more for like drying craft dough or that kind of thing because there was no air circulation and you really want something that's going to circulate the air. I think you can probably get a small dehydrator, please, if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, for $50 at, at like the Walmart. Now that other one, um, it's a little bit more expensive. It's a couple hundred. How many trays like should you aim for whenever you're dehydrating? Like how many? Well, it depends how much. Like <laughs> if you have a big garden and a lot of stuff, you're gonna and you're gonna dehydrate every day. You know, to be honest with you, I got started with this when I first came to Florida Extension, and we did some classes. And there was a lady there that to reduce waste, she dehydrated everything after a meal. Well, now, obviously you don't have a lot of butter and stuff on leftover carrots and throw them in a dehydrator, but, you know, um, or any casseroles or just meats, but your fruits and vegetables, you can put in that dehydrator and reduce waste that way. And um, so if then you'd only need a few trays, because you don't want to mix too much. I don't know if you remember me saying that if you mix them, the flavors may enter twine yep. and things like onions and garlic are pretty strong. So then you'd only need a couple trays or the small ones that you can get. Those are four or five trays at Walmart. So, you know, that's probably enough to get started. And then if you really, really like it, you know, maybe go on for the bigger things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Rick asked, after a few days of drying in a brown bag, do you just place in a jar to store or do you need to do anything else? Yeah, no, I like the jar. I like doing it in glass, but as long as it's an airtight container. Now, um, you can buy the desiccant packets that are food safe online. I've never seen them in stores, but, you know, like damp red for your closet, but they're little tiny packets that you can buy that are food grade that you could put in there with them. I bought some, but I've never put it in. So, you know, eat it up and enjoy it. I, I save those out of my vitamin and supplement bottles um, and to store seeds. Like when I gather seeds and put them in envelopes in the refrigerator after, after they've been properly dried and all that, um, you know, take, take them out of the supplements and vitamins and, and put them in there. So I imagine you could do the same with herbs because sure. they would have to be food safe if they were putting them yeah, in your good idea. So clever, Tara. I love that. That is awesome. <laughs> And it's a great way to recycle also. Yeah. So if anybody else has any questions, please feel free to go ahead and put them in the comments. And Prissy, I just have to ask you, are those artichokes in your background? What is that? Yes. Yep. Those are artichokes. They're in season right now and we are harvesting by the crate load. So uh, we'll be cutting these for a few more weeks and up until, uh, well, actually probably four more weeks. So yeah, this is part of our trial at the Hastings Research Farm um, at the Cowpen facility. That's great. I read something about that a while back. I didn't know that you were to the point where you're actually trialing them and harvesting them and being successful. I'm going to have to have you come on and do an online class sometime on growing artichokes. Very cool. Yeah, this is our... Um, 
our fifth year of artichoke production in Hastings. So we did three years of variety trials, followed by some nutrient management comparing controlled release to fertigation. And now we're focusing on phosphorus rates since our BMPs, um, our nutrient recommendations are now law. So maybe if I'm going to have a new crop to introduce to farmers, I can actually give them some nutrient recommendations as well in the near future. So that's what we're working on. But yeah, I'd be happy to chat with you. And they have Sorry. beautiful flowers, yeah. which I didn't know. I wish I had a picture to share with you guys. <laughs> they are gorgeous. So any problems with nematodes? We grew them here in our garden. As I've already said, we have nematode issues. So we had them here. We were trying to do a trial of them to see how they would do. And some of them did okay, but some of them really just did not do well at all. So have you picked different varieties or varieties that are not as susceptible to nematodes or how they've been managing that? Uh, we haven't had nematode issues, but we also fumigate our fields before we plant anything. So, um, but with our varieties, you know, we were focusing on, on yield, not so much pest management, but again, we did not have nematode problems in our fields, but we automatically treat for those preventatively before we plant. Um, but Green Queen, as far as yield, has been our best producer for the Hastings area. And chatting with Dr. Um, Shinsuke Akahara, uh, it's similar results um, for the bomb area as well. So that's been my personal favorite because artichokes are a thistle. They're prickly. And Green Queen was the nicest one with the shortest thorns <laughs> from a harvesting perspective. And from a processing perspective, if you're into culinary arts, you're very appreciative when they're not as prickly. <laughs> well, so we have I a have question a here about how, how do you cook them? Any advice on cooking artichokes? I've honestly mm -hmm. never cooked them before. I like artichokes, but I've never bought them fresh and cooked them. Uh, yeah, I'm an ag agent. I'm I'm not FCS. I do not give any advice <laughs> on how to cook them. <laughs> I steamed them once, and that was successful. And and that's the only advice that um I can offer. <laughs> but I can hear that you can stuff the big ones, and then the little babies. You can um, you know if you want to you know, process them for the hearts and your fancy salads. Uh, a lot of things you can do. Um, a lot of the Italian chefs in the area have been very familiar with this crop and what to do with them. So um, a lot of folks from Mediterranean climates uh, really were excited and knew what to do with it because 99% of our production comes from California. So those of us on the East Coast, especially in the Southeast, are like, what is this? What do we do with it? <laughs> so getting help from our friends <laughs> has been great. I dropped a link in there. And this one, I mean, not again, we are not promoting a website over another, but this one had a lot of good information on how to select, prepare, gave quite a few different recipes on stuffing, grilling, um, what are the other, um, how to boil an artichoke, just the preparation time. And if you have a pair of kitchen shears, that's especially helpful. And then there's even one for ranch stuffed artichokes. Thanks, See, we even have recipe ideas on here for you. So if anybody has any other questions, if you go ahead and put them in the chat box. Um, one thing we haven't gotten any questions on this morning is mindfulness that Wendy and Tara covered very, very well. And kind of motivated me to spend a little bit more time and effort and put aside a little uh, time for that. So if you guys want to kind of talk a little bit about how gardening can help with mindfulness and relaxation and some of the, the benefits other than what we might think of, like we've talked about, you know, hey, I end up with artichokes that I can cook or carrots that I can make into a recipe or I can freeze them. What are some of the other benefits of gardening? Uh, so you know, there are numerous uh, health and wellness benefits to gardening. So I, um, the physical benefits are the most obvious as far as, you know, strengthening muscle tone. Um, and as someone, I don't think we talked about this, but as someone who, you know, I, I love to do yoga, you can actually incorporate 
yoga while you are gardening, if you situate yourself you know, properly as far as being mindful of um, rather than uh, straining your back or your legs or your knees, if you if you situate yourself the right way, you can actually get, um, you know, a proper workout and, and a, a healthy stretch at the same time. And then, you know, for the emotional and, um, you know, mental benefits, um, just being out there in the fresh air and seeing the color green, you know, the color green has been proven to have healing benefits um, as well as the, um, not the microorganisms, but like maybe the mic. There's like bacteria, yeah, microorganisms in the soil mm -hmm. that are also um, contribute to healthiness. Um, just the, the act of gardening itself, you innately get uh, benefits um, physiologically. Um, you know, it helps to, helps to regulate your your whole system. So, and I think Fridays are a really good time for gardening. Um, you know. I was just thinking we have a bunch of master gardeners outside right now, gardening, prepping for our plant sale next weekend. And I was thinking that, wow, Friday is a good day to go out there and join them because you know, they're getting nice at workout and relaxed before the weekend. Anyway, there's so many benefits. You always feel good mm -hmm. when you go out and you spend a little time outdoors with nature in any type of green space. Just getting the fresh air, getting away from our desks and outside of our homes. Mm -hmm. And I know we talked about mindful walking, so you could mindful walk through the garden. And I'm looking at some of the comments um, about mindfulness in, in the garden. And that reminds me of an intentional exercise you can do while you're out there. And that's where you pay attention to five things or like to yourself, you, you name like five things you can see, five things you can smell, five things you can hear, taste and feel. And when you intentionally do that, um, it takes, takes your mind out of the in here and just kind of adds like a meditative element to it. I've always found it's a really good way to kind of clear your mind and basically dump everything out of it. Yep. It helps totally you to get more centered and grounded. And then if mm -hmm. you incorporate breathing exercises as well, um, if you're out in the garden and you are doing breathing exercises, I mean, you're combining everything. You're just going to be so healthy. So if we have any other questions from our viewers, if you just go ahead and put them in the comment box, we'll go ahead and answer them for you. Um, I want to know what's everyone's favorite spring vegetable and how do you use it? And I know Lori it, it does a lot of food prep classes um, and I always defer to her because I am not <laughs> the expert in that area. I'm still learning as I go. Any favorites across the board? Lori, any suggestions what you could do with um, things that you might be picking in the garden right now? I'm not sure exactly what Norma's picking. I know we're kind of in a transition. Those spring vegetables are growing. Uh, it won't be long before we're picking Green beans, not too long after that, you'll be getting tomatoes also. Um, yeah, I think we're kind of in a transition. I know my garden is, <laughs> some things are popping up, but I definitely got a later start than usual. Um, but I do like um, using um, a lot of fresh veggies on the grill. Um, you know, a lot of times we heat up our houses, but Florida is a great place to use your grill. And grilling is a really, um, can be a really healthy way of cooking your food. Um, you can um, season it with some fresh herbs and um, spices, or you can um, use dried as well, um, eliminating salt to decrease your blood pressure and make it heart healthy, um, and using healthy oils um, and coating them with um, olive oil 
um, can help um, help it from sticking to the grill. Um, and you don't have to have any fancy grill pans or anything. You can just use um, a little heavy duty um, aluminum foil and make little aluminum foil boats and put them in there. Or the bigger pieces you can put directly on the grill, um, just making sure um, they're at least a half an inch to an inch thick. Otherwise, they're probably going to burn pretty quickly. Um, but it doesn't take long to grill veggies um, on the grill. And some folks don't like certain veggies in another form. So grilling can be a way that you can cook it quickly, um, give it a little seasoning and flavor, um, and not heat up your house either. Thank you. So, so I could say tomatoes because we grow so many, but another one of my favorite vegetables is eggplant. And a lot of people, for some reason, they don't favor eggplants, but I do like it. And there are several different varieties that you can try. So there's the huge ones that are great for um, for like eggplant parmesan. So those are the black beauty types. And then you have the Ichiban or the Japanese types, which are the slender ones. But any type of eggplant, um, I, I do I do like. Norman, there was one that I tried. Um, somebody grew it in my in the Putnam office, and it was like a purple and white variety of eggplant. It was delicious. It cooked well. So, it had a great flavor. I don't know what the name of it was, but it was awesome. Yeah, there, there are lots of different colors of eggplants. So the, there's a there's a purple and white variety. I think it's called Rosita. It's an heirloom variety from Puerto Rico. Um, so it's possible that it might be that particular one that you that you tried. Um, the key about harvesting eggplants is that you have to harvest them when they still have that shine to them, and if you harvest them when they're dull, then they're getting to be on the old side. So it's key that you know the right time to harvest your eggplants. Okay, I think we have one last question here. And I'm not really sure who can answer this one, but let, let's give it a shot anyway. Uh, has anyone been successful growing kiwi in Florida? They say you need both a male and a female plant. What is the difference? Prissy, do you have any idea? I've never grown kiwi before. Um, I think it needs to, does it need to be in a cooler climate? I'm, I'm very ignorant about kiwi. You know what? I actually looked this up recently and please correct me, any of you Hort agents that, that know better because I have wanted to grow kiwi and I discovered it grows better in South Florida. And that is probably Ooh. why we don't hear about it here. But please enlighten me if anyone knows more. I know nothing. I just know I like eating them. So if anyone grows them or tests those out, I will I will be your taste tester. <laughs> well, we are going to try them in our new food forest, regardless of if they produce. We are going to try. That's I will exciting. say they grew kiwi in North Carolina when I was there. So you could grow kiwi in North Carolina. So I don't know why we wouldn't be able to grow it here. Yes, yeah, so if, if they can grow it in South Florida, I don't think they would jump over Central Florida to get down to South Florida, and that's not get to do it. So yeah, so I for here sounds like a good project. Yeah, I don't know anything about growing kiwi. I always thought of it as a temperate crop. So um, yeah. that is something that I guess one of you who are able to go on to um, to Google now could probably look into that. Um, but what I would say, whether it's kiwi or other fruits, it's good for you to know the zone that you can grow that particular crop in. So for us here in Central Florida, we're 9A and 9B. So when you go to the, the garden center, you will see that they have, let's say, persimmons or some other temperate fruit that has fruit on the tree and you purchase it and then it doesn't bear for you. And one of the reasons might be that we don't get enough chill hours and that's 
where we have temperatures below 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And so if you don't have enough chill hours, it's not going to fruit. So that might be something you want to look into when you're, ch when you're researching the persimmons. If it's a temperate fruit, how many chill hours does it need? And so for us here in Central Florida, you want to stay around 300 chill hours. Try not to go too much higher than that. So I see Lisa looking at her computer intensely. Did you find anything? Oh, no, Lisa? I'm trying to see if they've got anything with University of Florida on Kiwi. And I'm now questioning my facts about South Florida. So I'm trying to look that up too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in North Carolina. I'm Something still thinking about eggplant. Norma grow... made me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I know that they grow passion fruit commercially in South Florida. And I've seen uh, in catalogs before that they say kiwi can grow in 9A and 9B, but I've never known anybody who actually grew it or grew it successfully and got anything off of it. So, yeah, the kiwi needs 400 chill hours. So it, oh. I probably, I actually, now that you said passion fruit, I was also simultaneously researching passion fruit. And I may have got that confused with why uh, passion fruit is grown more in South Florida, not the kiwi. Yeah, so that would be, um, probably it would do better in North Florida, Georgia, those areas. Okay, guys, guess what? We filled the screen up. We have a full 10 people on here. Um, Allie's on here with us, and she, Allie, what county are you from? I know that Allie works with 4-H youth. I do. I'm in St. John's County. Oh, okay. You're the other side of the state from us, from me. <laughs> yeah, a little far away. And we have Crystal on here also. Yes, I'm uh, Crystal McCasium with 4-H Youth Development, uh, now in Marion County, but was in Putnam County for 15 years. So, yeah. Okay, we're pretty close to wrapping it up for the day, but I want to give both of you a chance to talk a little bit about um, how you work with youth and how important it is to teach them about food systems. And I guess, if nothing else, where their food comes from. So many children think it's kind of built in the back room at Publix. They don't know this stuff actually grows in the ground outside. So what do you guys do with, uh, what kind of programs do you do to teach kids where their food comes from? Oh, I'll go first, Crystal. Sure. <laughs> um, so um, we, I think it's really important, especially in our county, we um, come from primarily urban population. So we have a lot of our youth who don't have that knowledge. So Prissy and I like to partner on a lot of things like our berry project and our pumpkin project. And that really gives them the opportunity to see firsthand, you know, from start to finish, you know, from growing the plant to learning how to prepare it. And Wendy helped us with our pumpkin project. It was really great. That you got to um, harvest and learn about all the varieties and different things you could do. But um, it's really important. So we like to try to do a lot of programs that involve food systems. Just to tag on to that, you know, even uh, I think a lot of our 4 h some of them assume they're a very rural population and, and they're not. And even the ones that are in that, you know, like I said, coming from Putnam County, we look at Putnam, Putnam County as a whole as fairly rural, but they're still pretty far removed from that farm. And so they still have a lot of kids coming into those classrooms with the understanding of, oh yeah, my food comes from the grocery store. So it, it truly is important to understand that process and for them to be educated consumers. So even if they're not looking for a career in agriculture, even though we want to make sure they understand and know all of those options, uh, they want to, you know, we want to make sure that they understand that their food is safe and healthy and all of that process it takes to get to that plate. And so we do that in multiple ways through school enrichment, uh, ag literacy programs, as well as the Tri-County Potato Project with St. John's is also St. John's, Flagler, and Putnam are a part of that. So the Potato Project is a huge opportunity for us to partner with other organizations as well and bring all of the kids in and actually to the farm to do the project. So they get really hands-on. So I really think it, it happens in that, like I said, multifaceted, whether it's in that school classroom and our 4-H clubs, 
and different countywide programs and even summer camps. We try and offer a food system summer camp every summer. Bill, I and dropped a link oh, in. Sorry. Yeah, no, nope, I was Go just going to say I dropped a link to the potato project video um, that from UFIFIS and it it'll go into some of the details and actually I think Chrissy's featured in it, Crystal, myself, and a few others of our agents that'll take you through that process of the potato okay. project. And we, I think, have one final question here on the screen about grilling corn and I'll go ahead and copy that link and put it on here. Yeah, if there's some information about grilling corn into the chat, um, you basically want to get your grill to about medium high heat. If you're putting it directly on the grill, you want to um, put some olive oil on those grates um, with your um, maybe a paper towel with your tongs and kind of rub them over there so they don't stick. Um, if you wrap it in foil, um, it's going to take a little bit longer, but usually 10 to 15 minutes um, and then just rotate halfway through so that you're not just burning one side, but it really doesn't take that long at all. Um, but every grill is a little bit different, so get to know your grill. Um, start off small, you can always add more time. Yes, I have learned once it's burnt, you can't go back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I, I put that information in the chat box also for everybody about grilling corn. So it looks like it's about that time. I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Um, Wendy, do you have anything you'd like to share? Yeah, Anybody have well, any I just wanted, to say, just wanted to say thank you to all of our experts that you see on the screen for. Um, sharing your expertise, not only with us, but our community. And we hope to have everyone back again for maybe a summer or fall presentation of food systems and season. So we definitely will um, be open to hearing about ideas of what folks want to hear. But thank you all so very much. Yes, thank you so much, everybody who's been joining us week after week to um, participate in these classes. It's great when you ask questions, and if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to your county's extension office, because no matter where you live in Florida, no matter which county you live in, you have an extension office. So look them up, make use of them, ask your questions, and for all of our uh, uh, speakers here today, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day and joining in, and with that, I think we're going to say goodbye and hopefully we will see you all back here again for another series really, really soon. So thanks everyone. Thank you.